April Chief Messier, President and CEO of the National D-Day Memorial Foundation, and welcome to our Lunchbox Lecture today. I'm joined here today with John Long, our Director of Education. Hi, John. Hello, April. Fancy meeting you here. Well, I hang out up here. I you do. And I, it's kind of strange because I'm used to doing podcasts with you, and you're actually now yeah, on camera. On so. camera. <laughs> Don't have earphones. No, no. So this is great. But I'm really excited about uh, today's lecture because I thought it would be fun for all of our uh, visitors out there, for people to see some of the collection that we have, because we have a pretty magnificent collection that continues to grow. In fact, I think Absolutely. you're gonna share some of our newest things too, uh, as we talk today. 
Um, but really just wanted uh, everybody to get a sense of the collection that we have. And maybe you can talk a few minutes about just why having a collection in the first place is important. Uh, well, World War II just lends itself to this sort of material culture. There's such a wealth of the soldiers brought home souvenirs, they brought home equipment, whether or not they were supposed to, uniform pieces, patches, photographs. It was, uh, at that point in history, the most photographed war ever. Um, and uh, through the years, the World War II generation brought us their artifacts. Now it's more their children, their grandchildren, and great-grandchildren who are ready to pass things on. And uh, I think it's important because it connects, uh, especially a young person. Of course, we do a lot of school groups with artifacts, um, a lot of programs, and it connects them to the war in ways me just yammering on for a while about it can't do. And so it, uh, it, it really is an effective way to not only preserve the history, but teach the history. I think that's so true that there's nothing like seeing, and you've used this phrase quite a bit. It's like the silent witnesses to war. And exactly. I, I love that phrase because I think it's so important when you see an object that you know was there, but also it personalizes it. You know that it was connected to somebody uh, who took part in this momentous event and it, it tells their story. And it's really the stories that we're so drawn to True. in learning about mm -hmm. the war. Um, so we've got some interesting pieces, I think, uh, here today. We're going to talk more about the collection and how we collect a lot of these items in a little bit, but maybe we'll talk about a few of our newer and also some of our favorite pieces. I, I'm well, looking at one of my right. favorites your, right your favorite here. one's right here. Hold so, on, let me put my gloves on, there. my trusty gloves. And uh, gloves are something we try to wear when we're handling artifacts, depending on the artifact, of course, a textile, paper, photograph, or more vulnerable than say a bayonet that's uh it's not going to do a lot of damage to touch it but uh you know, certainly when you're handling artifacts it's good practice to have them on well this is one of my favorite pieces and it's it, hopefully you can see uh some of this here but this is a watch that was worn by jimmy foster and jimmy foster james jimmy foster um was a soldier who went in on uh, omaha beach on d-day um, and it's a great story about Jimmy, who was, uh, he'd only been married a few years. He actually married his wife, Margaret, the week after the attack on Pearl Harbor. And um, they were very much in love. And we, we, we can see that very much through the wallet that he carried, actually, also on Omaha Beach. Had all these beautiful photos mm -hmm. of him and Margaret. Obviously, he... Uh, treasured his wife a great deal, and you really see that. And, and that's part of what makes it so heartbreaking is because um, Jimmy uh, was actually uh, killed on Omaha Beach. We believe at the time that this watch stopped, um, which was right around, it looks like 825. Can't prove that. It stands to reason. Mm -hmm. Watches that day would have been very mm -hmm. sensitive to yes. pressure changes like an artillery shell going that's on. That's right. Um, and so, you know, maybe that's the time, uh, certainly yeah. poignant to think so. And it was such a, I think what makes this story, um, again, just so um, it, it connects with you is that you see the, the human side of the war and the losses, you know, because Margaret, um, she never remarried. I mean, uh, she was so devastated by his loss. Uh, in many ways, her life stopped at that moment as well. And I often think about that. Um, all of his family members left behind dealing with that loss. Um, and I think Jimmy Foster's story really speaks to that. And seeing this watch really speaks to that as well. But for many people, many families, time kind of stopped at that point. And um, it's important to remember that. But we certainly remember um, Jimmy Foster. And uh, I believe he was the only fatality in Waynesboro, mm -hmm. Virginia. And uh, so a great story, and we're so grateful that the family was actually the niece of Jimmy Foster who donated his things here so we could continue to share his story. So absolutely one of my favorite pieces here. Which I'm sure you so, have well, many. Well, yeah, oh, yes, right there. Go ahead tell us about that. Well, um, these are, being from Bedford, um, obviously I'm drawn to any of the Bedford Boys items as well. And this is one of the Bedford Boys, his binoculars, Frank Draper Jr. Uh, was actually wearing these binoculars on D-Day. Um, 
Uh, unfortunately, uh, Frank uh, was never even able to get off of his landing craft. He was shot in the arm uh, that morning. It was an extensive injury from, I believe, an anti-tank rifle bullet. Um, he lost consciousness pretty quickly. And I believe it was a British um, bowman who was trying to um, make him more comfortable, actually took the binoculars off his neck. Um, and uh, unfortunately, Frank Draper died shortly thereafter. And he, he kept these uh, for many years. Um, Bert, Bert Fuller. Bert Fuller, that's, that's right. right. And kept these for many years. And I think it was, um, I can't remember the exact year. He died in 2000. Uh, maybe I'd have to look on the computer. Um, um, that he donated, uh, the, actually he donated to the family, and then the family in 2005 donated the binoculars here to the National VA Memorial, so we can share Frank's uh, story. So I think, again, just a very powerful piece um, reminding us of the, the losses from that day. Um, yeah. And both of these good illustrations of how it's really the story that makes the artifact. Yes. If we had those binoculars uh, with no story behind them, right. we'd say, oh, meet some binoculars from World War II. They're, mm -hmm. they're interesting, but they wouldn't be as heartrending. That's so um, true. Or a watch um, you know, worn by a soldier. Mm -hmm. Interesting, right. you know, but uh, a watch worn by a soldier when he died, yeah. possibly reflecting the very moment he died. And, you know, change in the world of his, his widow. Well, and that's an important point to talk about because, you know, we get a lot of people who come to us that have a lot of items that they don't know what to do with and they want to donate. And obviously, we can't take everything. We have to be very yes. selective. We only have so much space and, and so many stories you can tell. Talk a little bit about, because obviously you just said that, provenance is really important which is really knowing more about the right. piece. Mm -hmm. um, tell us why that- and recording, you know, the recording the story with the story. Exactly. Piece, exactly. So tell us mm -hmm. how we go about, you know, determining what what we should collect and not why, you know, how, at least here, how do we do that? Um, of course, we're the D-Day Memorial. Mm -hmm. And so the closer an artifact is to D-Day, like these two pieces, mm -hmm. uh, the more important they are to our story, but we actually have a large collection beyond D-Day. Uh, reflecting the rest of the war, uh, reflecting uh, you know, a few pieces from before and after the war, um, the all home front. the home front, um, exactly. And um, another another thing that a lot of people don't really take into consideration when they, they call us or email me is that uh, things can get redundant after a while. Um, these are unique because again, they tell a compelling story. But other things, um, you know, it's, there were a lot of canteens right. and we have a lot in the collection. Uniforms, by definition, they're uniform. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, variation, obviously, in uh, was he wearing this on D-Day mm -hmm. or in the patch that he has on. But so much else, what we intended to save after the war were the uh, ice jackets, so it's not exactly a dress uniform, but a Kind of thing he'd wear out on liberty, right. um, not what he was wearing into battle. And so, um, you know, we have to turn the, those down a lot of times, not because they're not interesting, but just because how many ice jackets do sure. we need? And there and may be a better place, exactly, place better suited for I some try, of those items, too. I try to advise right. uh, someone right. if you know, there's nothing we need for our collection, right? Um, why don't you consider this or consider exactly. this place? Um, or Keep it in the family. I always mm -hmm. say artifacts like this should stay in the family right. before they right. come here. Eventually, they should. Yeah. Uh, you know, if they're historically important, be in a museum somewhere. But uh, it, while that uniform mm -hmm. is meaningful to the grandkids or the great grandkids, by all means, hang on to it. Sure. We'll still be here ten, twenty years right. from now if they want to donate at that point. And for many family members, it's just important for them to know that the story is being told. And they feel exactly. Like that it's for, for, for them, for those who decide to donate, it's, it's, it's kind of telling a larger story for people and, and getting that out there. And that makes me exactly. feel like it's um, serving a, a, an important purpose. Another thing uh, we turned out a lot are ration books. Yes. Uh, the ration stamp <laughs> books that everyone during the war used and everyone hung on to at the end of the war. I think people were probably convinced it was ration was coming back. <laughs> so they hung on to the stamps. Um, 
you know, 80 years later, mm -hmm. people are finding these and offering them to us. Well, we have mountains of right, these right. Um, Which we can use in some all educational identical. programming. Exactly, we do. Like we that, do a, lot, right. a lot of that. Um, and uh, in, in contrast, though, a letter. A letter is probably unique. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, wife wrote this to her husband, or her husband wrote it home to his wife. Um, that's probably you know the only example of that letter. And uh, we have a lot of letters in the collection, and I will usually give those very serious consideration. Uh, even though, truth of the matter is, a lot of soldiers didn't write great letters. Right. They they didn't want to worry mom at home right. um, or their sister. So what they wrote was. You know, warm here, <laughs> raining here. Yeah, <laughs> saw oh, Joe sorry. last week, that's and that's about it. They, they they skip a lot of petty details, but sometimes it's really surprising. No. And some letters, again, very pointed. Yeah. Uh, when yeah. you when you start reading them, and uh, especially the ones you know, maybe that husband mm -hmm. didn't come home. True. Uh, so yeah. yeah, that's that's a big part of the story as well. Well, do you have a favorite? I do. I brought mine. Uh, my favorite one when I talk about quite a bit. Um, I have to give a little background, of, although a lot of our viewers will know this story. But um, on D Day, as every man is waiting for the invasion, waiting to get into the landing craft, waiting to get onto their C 47 and jump into France, they received a printed message from Eisenhower mm -hmm. that's known as the Order of the Day. If you've taken a tour here, you know we have the biggest plaque we have <laughs> on site is a text of the Order of the Day. It's a pep talk, really. Um, and many of the men really took Eisenhower's words to heart, their inspiration of why they needed to go and run across those beaches or jump out of that aircraft. Um, and we know that because they mentioned it in their memoirs, they uh, mentioned in letters home, and they kept their copies. Uh, now, um, the, it's you know fragile paper to begin with, so we, we have, I think, five original orders of the day in our collection. Right. Uh, which is great. A but, lot of them didn't make it through the war. Exactly. The of, <laughs> you know, even yeah. if you saved it and stuck it in your pocket, you're getting ready to run through the, right. through the English Channel onto a beach and then you fight a world war. So a lot of them didn't make it home. Um, but uh, one that did, and, and the one that's most pointed to us was uh, kept by our founder, Bob Slaughter, who, who established the National D Day Memorial many years later in his retirement. On D-Day, he took his copy of the Order of the Day around to all of his buddies in Company D of the 116th Regiment and had them sign their name to the uh, document on the front and also on the back. Uh, and I think 75 men we've counted who signed the Order Bob's Order of the Day on D-Day. 11 of them died just within a few hours on Omaha Beach. 11 others died later on in the fight through France. Uh, and Bob wrote, uh, you know, in, when, when he wrote his biography later on, and in fact, he told Stephen Ambrose this, it's, he mentioned, this was mentioned in Stephen Ambrose's book on D-Day, um, that it was his most cherished memento of the war. And I think I know why, because a lot of these men did not come home. And and uh, uh, I often say to groups when I talk about Bob wanted this place to honor these men that didn't come home, not just the 11 that were on this, this uh, one piece of paper, but all of them who uh, gave their lives on D-Day. He didn't want the attention for himself. And he um, took that everywhere. We did. As he was trying to get support for the memorial, everywhere he went, and he went all over literally all over the world speaking to groups and this is what he would always bring out and show people like you said the mm -hmm. memorial before the memorial and because it meant so much to him but what i think is what you can't see right now so i'll just through this because the when we first received his order of the day bob had done a lot of work on it over the years by taping it <laughs> to keep it together <laughs> Um, and so we had to really uh, look at how to appropriately preserve it. And so some artifacts that we have, like Bob's Order today, um, need a little bit of preservation work because they've deteriorated over time, or in Bob's case, he had 
you know, I put a lot of tape on it every time to keep it together. Um, and we really wanted to right. bring it back to its original condition. So talk us you, through that. Bob, <laughs> Bob took his copy. He folded it off, stuck it in his pocket. So of course there were creases in it. And, and it was ever, you know, I kept a piece, folded piece of paper for a while, and it would start to separate at the creases. It, uh, you know, the, the tears get bigger. And so when we inherited this, we, we got Bob's papers, his photographs, his memorabilia uh, in 2016. When we inherited this, it was really in bad shape. Now, Bob had it framed, um, and I believe he probably built the frame himself, uh, so that when he took it to speak to a class, he came to talk to my uh, history classes uh, you know, two or three times, and um, you know he could turn around, he could show it, and um, but he had also taped it to the glass, uh, and you know Bob was a little too better; he was an archivist. Um, but uh, so when we got it, we we had to take it to a paper conservator who very carefully restored, you know, down to uh, I scanned one of our other copies of the Order of the Day. And send her a high resolution scan of that. And she printed it out on uh, similar paper. And um, I've, I've got a photograph of her actually laying in individual letters on that re uh, yeah, replacement paper uh, to replace what had been lost in the folds and creases and things. So it was quite, yeah, a, quite a job. An amazing process. And mm -hmm. she, I believe, she uh, had also restored quite a few of George Washington's yes. letters. Mm -hmm. You know, so these are these are people that really know what they're doing, and I and I think that's part of the process with our artifacts is to make sure we we are the caretakers of them, and uh, so we make sure that they're properly preserved. And and now it's just a beautiful piece. You can still see that the crease is a little that's bit. Right, but, yeah. Um, I believe the conservator, I forget the exact number, but there was something like three feet of scotch tape on this little piece of paper <laughs> that she had to remove and very carefully do uh, conservation work on the, on the original. So it's in better shape than it has been than 80 years. Yeah. Um, well, and and it's, you know, it's such a poignant artifact. Oh, it is. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's nothing we bring out often right. uh, because you know any, any handling of it, light, all these things are damaged until we'll show a copy of it more often than anything else. Uh, this is it kept in a safe and out of harm's way, but you know, for special occasions like this, uh, it's it's very poignant to, to show it off. And you mentioned light, and that is something else that you um, are careful with with artifacts, making sure temperature control, right? Sure there's not bright lights on things like um, our closet in here doesn't have windows on either side, so it's it just kind of managing it so things are right. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Kept secure. Um, and it's it's good practice to rotate artifacts, right. not to have especially paper or textile right. Right. on display for so, too awfully long, yeah. simply for that reason. Uh, it's, yeah. you know, the longer it's out, the less and likely it's going to survive. Exactly. Um, now, someday we will have we will our have big nice museum <laughs> education center. <laughs> And, plenty of exhibit space. Yeah, right. uh, environmental controls, light controls, and all things to, uh, yeah. to keep it out. But um, you know, it's just good practice, as I said mm -hmm. earlier, that the original is kind of the same. You have a copy out mm -hmm. to show the people. Uh, same thing with a lot of photographs. Mm -hmm. we'll, it, it's much better to put the copy out if some kid walks by and sure. spits his chewing gum on it. Then, you know, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> 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 then uh, you know, you know, you just have the copy. Right. Um, right. So, Good practice, um, but we, we we you know keep the originals for that reason too. So. Well, I'm looking over here because I see something else that I love, and that's Jack Rose medals. Yes, um, that's another one of my favorites too. But can you talk a little bit about Jack Rowe because it's such a moving story? Jack Rowe, and uh, probably can't see very well with the camera, but he's there he is there in the corner. Was a Coast Guardsman on D Day. Jack was uh, from Rhode Island, served on um, a, a Coast Guard vessel uh, in the home front and then North Africa and then to France. And uh, throughout all of his journeys, he kept a, a typewritten journal. He actually had a small typewriter in his sea bag. And um, he would day by day record what they had done that day. Uh, you know, 
a lot of times more of the fun and games than the business end of things, but uh, you know, still great, great resource of what it was like uh, for a Coast Guardsman. Uh, in fact, uh, a lot of people don't realize the Coast Guard was involved in D-Day, but uh, they, they certainly were and played a very important role. Well, Jack, uh, in his diary on June 6, 1944, uh, wrote a, a, an entry about this, uh, you know, the big show, the big show. <laughs> and that he was uh, getting ready to go over the side, which means his landing craft would be lowered down from the bigger mm -hmm. ship. Um, and then he closes it out by saying, and this is my direct quote, but uh, at, uh, when I get back, I'll have a lot, lot to tell. As for coming back, I have no doubt that I will, mm -hmm. but it wasn't true. Uh, Jack Rowe was killed on D-Day, just probably an hour or so after he typed that, uh, that entry into his ledger. This is his Purple Heart uh, that was awarded for his death on D-Day. Some of his other Coast Guard medals recorded in this. We got this from his family uh, just last year. We got some of Jack's other artifacts earlier, uh, including the journal. And so uh, again, just the, the Coast Guard tends to get overlooked a lot and we want to tell the whole story of D-Day and so to have these uh, to pay tribute not just to one man but to an entire branch of the military that uh, did their job. And that's why I love this artifact in particular, Jack's things, because again, like you said, it highlights a lesser known role uh, during mm -hmm. D-Day. As you said, a lot of misconception that the Coast Guard was not involved and here we have a young Coast Guardsman who was actually killed on D-Day. So it's a, not only a powerful story, but helps us highlight some of those lesser known stories. And a lot of our artifacts do that, which I think is really important. So you spend a lot of time kind of also looking at where are the gaps in the collection? What are the things that we might need to tell some of those other stories? Because I'm sure there's some things we have a lot of, and then there's probably gaps. So what are some of there our gaps? Are, um... One thing that uh, we're a little better than, yeah. than we used to be, but um, the D-Day invasion was in a lot of ways about the Holocaust. Mm. Um, yeah. Now, the average infantryman running across the beach didn't have you know, an idea of what was going on in places like Auschwitz, but we historians yeah. know that that's the context in which this yeah. is happening. Um, and we had early on in the uh, memorial's existence donation of some things belonging to a member of the French resistance who was in a concentration camp. Uh, and we, uh, we are showing those. Um, yeah, that's uh, one of my favorites, the uh -huh. Yurkov collection. Yeah. David, uh, David Burke, yeah. Gary, he yeah, emphasized the name later on, Kirchhoff. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. but it's such a powerful, we also have the scrap, his photo albums yes. of mm -hmm. the family. And to me, what's very powerful about that is you have these photo albums that before the war, you have all these vibrant photos of the family picnicking, uh, traveling to the United States and, and being together. And then suddenly there's this gap of yes, quite yeah. a few years, and which are obviously the war years. And then when it picks back up after the war, you don't see those other family members anymore. Mm -hmm. They're all gone. It's just uh, David, it's, uh, and, his David and his mother. Yeah, and I think that to me just uh, says so much. So those important artifacts and then you have some, something um here. so when things come in that can help us to tell that story of the holocaust as a reason for d-day even happening in the first place uh, again we're very interesting not long ago uh we got a donation of artifacts from a uh the son of a chaplain in the army named peter monsma and um uh, he was dutch born grew up in uh in the united states spoke Dutch, spoke German, spoke English all fluently, and became a Presbyterian minister so that during the war, he was a chaplain uh, with replacement and often served as a translator because he spoke the language so well. And some of the artifacts that he brought back, uh, this little painted tile that, uh, again, I don't know how clear it comes out on the, uh, on the, uh, the, the video, but shows the Dutch flag and a cross and a helmet down here. And in Dutch says, uh, it records the date of the German invasion, 10 May, 1940, and then says in memory of the fallen in Dutch. And these were produced in Holland during the war, but of course, 
displaying this was not a good idea during the German occupation, so this would have been secretly kept. Uh, Peter Bonsma got one and preserved it for us. And then maybe even more poignant uh, is this that he brought back, uh, one of the uh, you know, well-known yellow stars associated with the Holocaust. Now there in the center, uh, it says, kind of a funny script to our eyes, but it says Jud, which is the Dutch word for Jew. And so this is what would have been sewn on a Jewish person's uh, clothing to identify that man or woman as a Jewish um, you know, resident of Holland. And um, then, you know, would have been certainly used to, to round up Jewish people as well. Now, this particular piece was never used. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, it, it's not as you know, gruesome maybe as one that came off of a coat someone sent to Auschwitz. Uh, but still, it's a reminder of the inhumanity uh, that happened. And I like to think of it sort of the opposite. The fact that it wasn't used means mm. this may be someone who survived. Um, you know, I don't know. He may have just found it in a warehouse. But again, these are, are pretty rare and uh, a, a story that needs to be remembered. Absolutely. Again, a great teaching tool that you share uh, with others who come and visit. And many of these we do have on display here in our education cue cards so that you can come up and mm -hmm. visit the collection. And we do um, a great job of rotating some of those out so that we have new things. And in fact, we just received just a new received artifact. Just one, speaking of watches. <laughs> um, so that's a very that cool This watch. is a Wittenauer military watch from, I uh, don't know exact year, 1942 or three, I believe. And it was worn by a paratrooper by the name of Donald Jakeway. And um, he wore this on D Day when he jumped into France near Seminary Blis. He wore this again when he jumped into the Market Garden. And he wore this again when he served during the Battle of the Bulge and received a wound that nearly killed him. And, and it still works. It still works. So it's not wound right now. But, but it, it uh, yeah, if I did wind it. Still works. I mean, most right. watches today, after you know, well, a year, stop <laughs> working. So here we have. <laughs> and uh, this this was donated just this past June. So that's uh, right. Our dear friend uh, um, Pat Waters, the grandson right. of General Patton, uh, donated this uh, because he he uh, recognized that it's something that should be in right. um, a museum dedicated to D-Day. So uh, it's not on display yet, but it will be uh, to show that uh, that story of Donald Jakeway. Well, another, again, really important story, um, talking about the paratroopers, uh, for sure. So being able to have uh, something like that to tell his personal story, which, again, highlights you know, the full story is great. Right. Now, I keep showing off some other things that have recently yeah. come in. Um, you can use yeah. your, your gloves there as a Kleenex. If you yeah. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> well, this is another a lot of here, very so. poignant story. This is Everett Hill. Uh, um, who was a Roanoke D-Day or a uh, uh, National Guardsman and a D-Day uh, fatality died on uh, Omaha Beach. Um, took a while as he was missing, declared dead. Date was changed to June 6th, but we know that he died. He uh, was buried in Normandy. Um, a New Testament, and there are several of these artifacts he's donated by his daughter. New Testament that I don't know, but I'd like to think this this may well have been in his pocket uh, on sure. D-Day. Most, most of them did. Uh, and uh, then this is uh, a little bit rough, and again, maybe a little hard to see. Uh, this was a photograph of Hill's wife and daughter, and the daughter of Virginia was the donor of this collection. She's still living. Um, and uh, this photograph, what really touched me about this photograph is that it was mailed, you see the date there, May 30th, 1944, which means Everett Hill never would have received it. Uh, there was no way for the mail to get from Virginia to England uh, when in fact he was, you know, sealed off. In, in, uh, yeah, seen yeah. It. So he, he never would have seen this. Wow. This would have been returned uh, to Mrs. Hill, um, probably marked deceased. And uh, I don't know the circumstances of when they got the telegram, but it did happen that sometimes 
things like this, a letter marked deceased, beat those telegrams. And so that was how the family found out. Um, so again, very poignant uh, uh, very, very to think about what it would have meant to him to see his little girl. Little he only saw her as an infant, as a baby. Wow. Um, there, there are pictures of, of them at, when, you know, holding his little baby daughter, um, and then photographs as she grows, and she's you know, like three, I think, right mm -hmm. here. Um, but uh, you know, I think what it would have meant to mm -hmm. him to, to, to have, have seen, seen this. That. Oh, that's a wonderful, you know, this makes me think of, um, I believe it was Ernie Pyle who talked about when he landed, he actually came in on duty, I think, the mm -hmm. day after, and he was so taken by everything that was strewn across the beaches. He said it was almost just um, just in, in, unfathomable just to see all these personal items, you know, just random right. mm -hmm. things from someone's pockets, you know, all these thousands and thousands who had landed, toothbrushes and Bibles and everything strewn everywhere across the beach. And he was really That's taken by that because uh, at the high tide line, at the high, yeah, just all of this mm -hmm. stuff was coming in and he just realized, you know, there's a story with every single thing that he was looking at um, and how many of them probably uh, did not survive. So uh, it, it makes you uh, think about all the individual stories with pieces like this Bible and and, and, oh, and, and speaking and, of Ernie Pyle, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Ernie Pyle, the war correspondent, Ernie Pyle, uh, just beloved by yeah, the I men know. of World War II. He was probably the favorite war correspondent. And one reason he was known to give out Zippo liners, which were hard to get during World War II, and uh, every man wanted one of these um, because you know, it, was a, it was a generation that smoked a lot. Yeah. Um, so a Zippo lighter was a great prize. Well, uh, according to the story from the donor, the son of a uh, soldier from Martinsville by the name of Phil, Phil Moore Minter was the, uh, his father's name. Um, Ernie Pyle interviewed Phil Moore about B-Day uh, a month or two afterwards and as a thank you gave him a Zippo lighter. And again, I know it doesn't show up um, you know, on the, the little camera we have here. Uh, but there is Ernie Powell's name written on there, which Phil Moore put on there later on and then his name on the back. Uh, so this, uh, again, is kind of an interesting little piece of the culture of the yeah. day, but also a testimony to this beloved war correspondent um, who, not long afterwards, uh, was killed himself in the Pacific. So uh, we have the Ernie Powell lighter there. I love that. Is a, uh, is a great nice. artifact as well. What else do you have? We've got a couple of little oh, pieces that. Oh, yeah. yeah, probably uh, more than we have time to talk about. Oh, we have about 13,000 artifacts That's in all. our collection. So there might be a part two. Yeah. Or, or <laughs> I'm just part, keeping one if you want. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take a break. Uh, these are the medals that belong to a, a member of the Navy uh, Beach Battalions. Uh, Navy combat demolition units, is in many ways, the forerunners of the modern Navy SEALs. Uh, his name was William Freeman, and uh, he was awarded the Navy Cross for service first in North Africa, and then won uh, his second Navy Cross for service on B-Day, helping to clear the exits off of the beach. And so if you see the little star there that's on the ribbon, that's the second uh, Navy Cross. Uh, you didn't get a second medal. You got that star to put on first. Uh, so that reflects D-Day, as does his Purple Heart from D-Day. And then there's a uh, uh, French Croix de Guerre, and uh, I believe that's the Navy Good Conduct Medal. Uh, and then there's several other medals as well, but that's what fits in this case. Um, and uh, again, great story of, of this, this uh, man. A lot of people don't realize the Navy was there on the beach uh, doing very important work. Um, and while he was, he was wounded, he survived. Um, but a lot of a lot of sailors died on B Day as well, and not all of them on the ships. Uh, they were they were on the beaches, helping to clear uh, the beach, keep it clear for the light, later waves, and um, uh, you know as the tide comes in, uh, take some of get out out of the way the wounded first of all, because a lot of them were wounded on the beach and had to be moved. But also a lot of that just detritus of war that they have accumulated on the beach. That's a great, great reminder yeah. of that. And the uh, the Navy Cross, mm -hmm. uh, 
people don't realize that it's only below the Medal of Honor. Uh, and so that is that and a an Army Distinguished Service Cross are the highest medals we have in our collection for D-Day. Um, and again, the, the heroism yeah. that's involved in uh, achieving one of those. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we uh, say so we collect mainly D-Day items and the European theater occasionally will branch out. And so if this is the case, you know what it is? I'm not sure. This I'm not is, sure uh, well, you see the patches down below, the yeah. variation of patches from the China, Burma, India. Uh -huh. And uh, this is a bloodshed. Uh, one of two or three, we have a bloodshed here, uh, which was used uh, if a man had been were shot down on the, over the hump flights from uh, India into China. Uh, he, you know, he uh, probably does not speak the local language. In fact, you're going to fly as you're flying to your, your destination to deliver supplies. You're probably going to fly over a dozen different languages. And so these were printed uh, sometime with dozen languages on them, uh, basically saying, I'm an American, I'm your friend. If you assist me to get back where I'm supposed to be, you'll be rewarded for it. And so uh, the blood chips were sometimes sewn onto their jackets, uh, sometimes carried, you know, but uh, uh, you know, not usually framed. <laughs> but that, uh, yeah, that is a, uh, an interesting piece. And again, that's nothing to do with eBay. Yeah, but we want to tell the whole story. I was going to say, and I think you have to look at D-Day in the context of the whole war. You do. Because D-Day couldn't have happened if the Marines and the Army weren't doing what they were supposed to do in the Pacific, if there was not, uh, you know, the China Burma India Theater um, of Operations, you know, all of it. Um, yeah, it's important to understand all of the oh, aspects of each other. So, yeah. Very absolutely. Good. And um, we do programs on um, the entire war. Yeah. Not just on D Day because you know we there's a lot to talk about. Right. Um, yeah. Case in point, some yeah. boots. I think you know where these came I from. I love these. Our friend Pete Kessler. He's probably Jersey. watching now. Hi, if he's not watching live, he's watching <laughs> recorded later on. We love the boots. Pete, uh, this is, these were Pete's uncles. Man, by the name of Moritz Kessler. Uh, and these jumped into Market Garden, which was the Allied attempt to cross the Rhine. September 1944, it's a few months after D-Day, uh, did not work. This was supposed to be, you know, uh, envisioned by Montgomery, especially as a way we're going to win the war and bypass the German defenses and move on to Berlin. Didn't quite work out that way, but um, uh, Pete's uncle wore these, survived, uh, brought them home, um, and uh, left them to Pete, who had them restored. But uh, the uh, paratrooper boots were highly prized artifacts well, during the war. That was a badge of honor, your it paratrooper was. boots. So this this would have been something extraordinarily important um, uh, to him. So this is beautiful. What, and it's so nice that Pete was able to get them restored um, because they, they took a beating. They did. <laughs> so I, many, many of them, we were just having a conversation in the podcast uh, recently about um, the uh, 11th um, Airborne, mm -hmm. and of course, being in the Philippines, and a lot of their uh, boots literally rotted off their feet. Um, and you know, the rest of their and, clothing, too. And exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so Not the most some hospitable. Some of the conditions were, exactly. were difficult, but this is great. Right. Uh, now, uh, I will say, though, uh, we certainly don't require people to restore artifacts, uh, exactly. and we may not always restore artifacts. One thing, right. it's an expensive prospect, right. and we have to be selective about what mm -hmm. we can do, but uh, also, um, you know, some things you want to look like they went through a world war. That's right. uh, you don't want to look like they came out of a, uh, you know, box. Mm -hmm. um, so these are great, yeah. uh, but they would also be great if uh, mm -hmm. they showed you know, some wear and tear that uh, Lawrence Kessler had put on them. Yeah, that's fantastic. And uh, again, we have about 13,000 artifacts, uh, a, a lot more than we can show. But I thought these were a good thing to, uh, to bring up as well. Uh, last year, we got a donation of uh, about two dozen World War II propaganda posters from a library who had saved them. But over the years, they just sat in a box and they finally decided they should go somewhere else. 
So um, I love these. Yeah. I only brought, so I think, three of them mm -hmm. here, but enough. And again, some of it's very poignant uh, to see these posters that were so iconic of the war, uh, who said, let's say so much about the war effort. Uh, here's one with, of course, the mm -hmm. famous flag raising photo uh, and a couple of different posters we've done off of this, but uh, you're raising money basically buy your war bonds. And um, the this propaganda posters were just such a great for raising awareness and building morale. And, and they're so uh, uh, reminiscent also. People yeah. today yeah. see them and uh, of course, you know, the number of people who remember mm -hmm. the war so yeah. clearly that's that's going out through yeah. years yeah. but uh still it's it's so iconic of the war uh including mm -hmm. original copies of norman Rock, rockwell's yeah. four freedoms um and uh, if you don't know about that look it up it's a it's a great story rockwell of course beloved american illustrator uh this one is freedom of speech but there were three others and there were original copies in this collection um which we do not have we have you know, obviously you can yeah. find copies of this just by you know, googling it and printing it, but uh, yeah, it's great uh, they have these everything. originals exactly. That's wonderful. And then this one's probably my favorite one in the whole collection. It's a little bit fragile, so I'll and it's a big one. Careful, it is a big one. But it is. Oh, I know what this is. <laughs> Look at that. The Someone Talks poster. And uh, the reason why I find this uh, so important is that that's the name of our podcast, and that is the artwork we use for the name of the podcast. Uh, the um, um, Someone Talks encouraging people to you know, keep, the, keep their mouth shut about war secrets, such as something very minor. My husband is shipping out tonight. Uh, that could be overheard. Now, I don't know that, that it's ever been documented that that really happened, that, you know, a loose lips mm -hmm. literally sunk Thank ships, you. but the potential was there. And especially early in the war, this was one of the great uh, concerns was that uh, people would inadvertently give mm -hmm. away uh, secrets uh, and that the Germans might be listening. Turns out the Germans didn't have anything near a what? spy network in the United States. But again, we didn't know that. Didn't know. So right. it was very important. This is a, a little, little fragile on the seams. So uh, those are great yeah. pieces, John. And uh, there's several more. I say there's like 20, yeah, 24, 25 yeah. in that collection. Oh, wonderful. And then we have others, of course. So uh, anyway. Uh, so if somebody is looking through some of their family things and they realize they have something they're interested in donating, what do they do? Um, they should contact mm -hmm. um, us, mm -hmm. me probably, or get, get sent to my desk, right. um, and talk to it. And again, uh, we just can't take everything. Mm -hmm. um, we some some reasons we have to sometimes turn things down if it's uh, you know, not really World War II, and we right. get offers of you know, uniforms sure. from the Korean War. From, mm -hmm. so these are great pieces; they should be right. preserved as well. But it's not part of our collection. Uh, sometimes things are redundant, and especially if they're big. Uh, such as a foot locker. Mm -hmm. People people say foot lockers. People use foot lockers for years. They're, they're handy things to have. Eventually, the they call so me. Many, you know, yeah, just can't take every right. foot locker that exists. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uniforms, as I said before, sometimes they can get a little bit redundant. But anyway, uh, talk to me about what you have mm -hmm. um, and uh, as much of the story that you have. And uh, we if we it's not something we can accept we'll try to you in the direction, direction. Exactly. Right. and uh one more thing before we uh leave today just tell us a little bit about when an item comes in and it's accepted into the collection what process do you takes place from there obviously you have to know all these things that we have so <laughs> <laughs> well i don't know that's why we have a computer that's a lot of yeah. right. <laughs> um so if someone uh let's take uh the Ernie That's Pyle Ernie lighter Pyle here, lighter. Mm -hmm. um, the son of the soldier involved, brought it in, told the story. First thing he does is sign a donor form, mm -hmm. which is uh, important to see may want the tax write off. Right. And so that's that's part of that. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, just to preserve on their end the paper trail of what happened right. to that lighter. Um, then uh, we 
uh, next thing would be to accession it, which is the verb using it people use for uh, signing a number and recording it. Uh, yeah, once upon a time when we've been in a ledger or in a card file or something, of course now everything's computerized. And so we would put this on the computer uh, with as much of the story as we can tell. With, uh, I try to record anything that is, um, you know, like additional information mm -hmm. or connect it to another item in our, in our collection. So if we had another uh, Ernie Powell light, which we don't, right. you know, might say, see also such and such number. And uh, it's assigned an accession number, mm -hmm. which uh, records the year it was given and the donor and uh, the item within that set of, of do donations. Um, and uh, then uh, assigned a location in our archives so that it can be found because um, you know, it's often the case with museums that things are lost in the collection. They, right. they just don't know what happened to it. Um, that's just inevitable when you're dealing mm -hmm. with thousands and thousands of artifacts, but we want to minimize that. And so this would be given a number, uh, usually with a string tag, and this mm -hmm. was on display, so the string tag is, is not on it right now. Um, but some way to identify it. And then uh, kept in storage. And many, most of our artifacts are in storage. Okay. Most of our artifacts are not really artifacts that we would put in one of these cases. They might be letters, they might mm -hmm. be photographs, uh, they might be something we want to preserve, but not really for this purpose, maybe for a researcher to look at. Um, and even like the boxes or like exactly. acid free yes. boxes. Acid free, or, you know, control the humidity. Uh, controlling kind of tests because obviously, you know, moths are right. bad news for a wool uniform. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that also could be difficult, especially this time of year mm -hmm. in the summer uh, yeah. because the humidity goes up. Uh, but we, we do the best we can. And, uh, but having so, it in the database is nice because exactly. then if you wanted to do a, an exhibit on, um, well, the China Burma India Theater, and you could look exactly. up what pieces you have related mm -hmm. to that, it's a quick. Right, search. Do keywords. So, yeah. Ernie Pyle. Yeah. What do we have yeah. on Ernie Pyle? Mm -hmm. and exactly. We can just right. type that in and come up with it. Well, very good. Uh, with again, cross references, hopefully, within this, within the class okay. what it is. Um, and uh, also, not just for exhibit, but people will, mm -hmm. for students, some of the college students or graduate students will true. ask, What do you yeah. have on this? That's and true. Uh, we have a little bike and buy it from the bottom. Look at this. Yeah. Well, very good. Mm -hmm. Well, I think because there are so many artifacts that we're going to have to do this again sometime, pick some of our new favorites and um, do it again. I think everybody really enjoys seeing uh, the collection. So uh, we might have to do a, another one sometime, highlight a few new pieces and uh, yeah, Absolutely. keep everybody up to date. So, but in the meantime, thank you, John, for oh, all the work you, that April. you do. This is great. It's thank so you to Adam to sitting behind the computer. Exactly. Here. We have a great <laughs> education team, and it's so nice to be able to highlight uh, this amazing collection, um, not only with our students, but with visiting visitors who come here and get to see. They really do enjoy coming into our education, too, but just to see this sliver of what we have um, right. here on display. I mean, we have so many more artifacts, so I uh, look forward to new exhibits in the future. And hopefully, um, um, you know, a big education center at some point with big exhibits that you're, you're going exactly. to, you know, you'll, you'll have fun with that. We'll have <laughs> plenty to <laughs> fill in there. But anyway, thank you all very much for joining us today. Um, look forward to our next Lunchbox lecture and uh, please tune in anytime and thank you again. Come visit us at the Memorial and see what's